If you've ever tried to repair electronic equipment using schematic diagrams, this video is for you because I'm going to show you how to refactor and functionally analyze them. In the previous video, we traced out the Mead LX5 telescope drive and made connection diagrams which we then polished into three physical schematics. But to figure out how all this works, we need to break those down into understandable functions. Let's get started. Starting with the hand controller physical schematic, we're going to simplify the signals on the keypad so we can more easily see what the keys connect to in the rest of the circuit. This VSW power symbol connects to two keys, the north and south keys. We can copy it and move it right over next to them. Then we can eventually move these keys wherever they belong in the circuit. We can do the same thing with the two VCC symbols and the two ground symbols, moving them over to the keys they're connected to. These two symbols only serve as placeholders for the power and ground pins of the logic gate ICs. They're helpful on the physical schematics, but we don't need them anymore. Next, we can remove the board-to-board -board connectors, because now we only care about the signals going through them. We'll be directly connecting the signals instead. After that, we'll clean up some of the pin numbering notes and some other stuff about the physical hardware that we don't need anymore. Now let's take a look at the map light circuit. We can see that it's very simple and completely independent from the rest of the circuitry. We're going to move it to another sheet which will act as a home for small functions. We'll call this new schematic sheet accessories, and we'll use it to hold all of the small standalone functions. That way they don't clutter up the more complicated parts we're trying to understand. Looking at the north and south keys, we can see that they don't interact with anything else on this sheet. Their signals just exit through the hand controller cable on the yellow and orange wires. The near and far keys show the same situation. They don't connect to anything else here and just exit through the green and red wires. Over on the front panel schematic, we can see that once these signals get to the front panel, they go straight to the declination motor and focus connectors there. There's not much to them. We'll delete their signals here, then cut and paste the keys over to our front panel schematic that holds the rest of their circuit. This leaves the hand controller schematic much cleaner, and we also have more space to add tracking circuitry from the other sheets. We just paste them over and connect them to their front panel connectors. Then we can remove their connections to J3, since there was nothing over on the old sheet to connect to anymore. Later on we'll delete J3, like the rest of the internal connectors. Notice that we now have four standalone functions here on our front panel schematic. These chunks will go over to our new accessories sheet and join the map light circuit already there. Back on the old hand controller schematic, this VSW voltage source is set to be about 3.4 volts. VSW connects to the 8x2x switch, then through the north and south keys to the declination motor connector. That's the only place the VSW source is used, so we'll move it over to the accessories sheet to be with the north-south buttons and that connector. Here's the VSW supply, now over on the accessories sheet, along with one pole of the slew speed switch to switch the voltage between 3.4 volts or 12 volts for faster movement. So the declination motor speed is slower at the 2x speed and faster at 8x. When the north or south keys are pressed, they send the deck motor current in opposite directions, causing the motor to rotate the telescope north or south. Looking at the focus control, it works the same way. The near and far keys send current one direction or the other, driving the focus motor in or out for near and far focus. The current is fixed by the 12 volt supply and the 180 ohm resistor, so there's only one speed. The reticle circuit sends current in only one direction, but you have control over the amount of current and thus the brightness of the reticle. That's through this variable resistor, which is controlled by the reticle adjustment knob on the front panel. Finally, the map light is a very simple on-off switch sending fixed current through an LED. And so we've got our final accessories schematic. We also added the power connector. By moving these simple functions over to their own sheet, we cleared up the more complicated tracking and east-west slewing functions, 
and we'll dive into those next. Back on the old hand controller schematic, we've moved the remaining circuitry over to the left to make room and move the east-west buttons closer to the things they control. Only two signals leave this circuitry, which we've labeled by the color of their wires blue and brown. Those go through the front panel and then onto the base PCB. We'll go there now and prepare to move that circuitry over to this sheet. Looking at the circuitry on the base PCB, let's see what we can do here. One obvious cleanup is the power ground symbols for the three logic ICs where we've broken them out into logic gates. And three of the four exclusive OR gates aren't used, so we'll remove those two. This connector to the front panel can be removed, and we'll label the remaining three signals. Two of these signals connect to the two outgoing signals on our old hand controller sheet, and one goes to the front panel. This area is a crystal oscillator driving the clock input of a 14-bit counter. It's used as a clock divider because we only look at the Q14 pin, the most significant bit of the count. The counter is in free run since its reset pin is tied to ground. So the Q14 bit will toggle at the crystal frequency of about 3.3 million divided by 2 to the 14th power, which is around 16,000. The exact result is 200.55 Hz or cycles per second. So this section of circuitry is simply a 200 Hz clock with no other controls, and we can simplify by making this just a symbol for a clock. These two D-type flip-flops are connected to make a divide by 4 clock divider. They are configured as toggle flip-flops, their outputs reversing on each clock cycle, dividing the frequency by 2. Stacking them together makes them divide by 4. We'll model these two more simply with the new symbol. And here's our finished base PCB functional schematic. At this point, we can just nudge things a bit closer together and then combine all of this onto our other old hand controller sheet. Here is the combined sheet with the old hand controller circuitry on the left and the circuitry from the base PCB which we just added in on the right. These dashed lines show which circuitry came from the base PCB and this small bit from the front panel. The complete circuit has a switch to select a quartz clock for tracking objects in the sky or a manually set speed. It can also slew the telescope east or west using the E and W buttons and do that at two speeds selectable with the 2x, 8x switch. And to operate in the northern or southern hemisphere, it has the NS switch. That's a lot of combinations and we'll break them down, but first let's remove some low hanging fruit. For instance, here's an exclusive OR gate with its output driving a simple transistor circuit which inverts the output. We can replace this with an exclusive NOR symbol, which already includes the negated logic output. Here's another example, though this one is switched through the manual quartz switch. We'll replace that as well. Also, there are two poles of this switch wired exactly the same, so we can remove one. Here's the cleaned up schematic we'll use going forward. We've also removed reference designators, symbol names, and the physical boundary lines. We're ready to dive in to the manual court switch, the slewing speed switch, and the east-west slew buttons. And since there are several combinations, we'll take a few of them and make individual specialized schematics to help visualize their function. Let's first look at the two tracking modes selected by this switch and take manual first. We'll remove the switch and show the circuit as if it was permanently switched to manual. And since this exclusive NOR gate is no longer in the circuit, we'll remove it. We see that this CMOS switch, S1C, now has its control terminal fixed at 12 volts, which closes the switch. We'll show that by connecting the circuit through it. We're only looking at tracking for now, meaning the east or west slew buttons will not be pressed, so we'll model them as their unpressed voltages. Voltage levels for these CMOS logic chips are 12 volts for a 1 and 0 volts for a 0. Since one input of this exclusive OR gate is 1, the output is also 1. The upper 555 timer here is set up to generate single pulses on the east key down press. So again, for tracking only, its output is low, and so our exclusive NOR thus has output 0. This pole of the 8x2x switch doesn't matter, since either way the result is a 0 due to the pole down here. Following over to switch S1D, a zero on its control terminal means it's open, and so we can remove it. 
With east or west unpressed, S1A is closed and S1B is open. Let's show that directly. The resulting resistor series is used to set the manual tracking speed. RV5 is the tracking speed knob on the hand controller for the user to use. The other variable resistors are set at the factory. This lower 555 timer is configured to provide a square wave clock output at pin Q, with the frequency determined by the resistor series we just looked at on the DIS pin, and a capacitor at the THR pin. Nominally, it would be about 200 Hz. Let's follow it. This is one of the most interesting parts of the entire circuit, and we'll go through it thoroughly in another video. The key point is that it detects pulses coming from the 555 timer and uses those to change switches so that the timer pulses go through and the quartz clock is switched out. Whenever a clock is present on the 555 timer output, it will prevail, and whenever there is no signal from it, the quartz clock prevails. This logic around the north-south hemisphere switch reduces to just the switch as long as east or west is not being pressed. After deleting unused circuitry, this is our finished schematic for the manual tracking function. Summarizing, the remaining 555 timer generates a clock at roughly tracking speed, which can be adjusted through RV5 by a knob on the hand controller. Now let's see what happens when we switch the manual quartz switch over to quartz. The output of this exclusive NOR gate is zero, since neither east nor west are pressed. The switch passes this on to the CMOS switch S1C and opens it. The other switch here, S1D, stays open as before since nothing has changed on its control terminal. With infinite resistance on DIS, the 555's output at Q will stay low forever. As before, this circuit switches in any clock signal from the 555, but there's none now. So the quartz clock prevails and is simply passed into the divider. Here is our SAA1027 stepper motor driver. It generates four synchronized pulse trains for the stepper motor based on the frequency of the clock signal at the C input. The M terminal sets the direction of rotation, and we can see that the north-south hemisphere switch sets that, at least when not pressing the east or west keys. Now let's look at slewing, which is pointing the telescope using the east and west buttons. We'll first look at the 2x speed. Here we see that at 2x, lots of circuitry is disconnected, and so we'll remove it. And these gates also simplify at 2x. At 2x speed, nothing changes downstream. S1D is open, which means speed is controlled by our series of resistors here. Let's look at the behavior of the manual quartz switch when either west or east is pressed. In each case, the output of the exclusive NOR gate becomes high, so that even if the switch is set to quartz, the switch S1C will be closed, and the manual clock will kick in and override the quartz clock. This makes sense because the quartz clock can only move at one speed, so any slewing is going to have to use the manual clock, which can vary its speed. When west is pressed, its value changes from ground to 12 volts, or from 0 to 1 in logic terms. That causes S1B to close, and S1A is already closed, so only RV3 and RV1 are in the circuit. Lowering the resistance causes the manual clock to run faster, so it speeds up in the same direction it was already going during tracking. Now let's look at east, which slews in the opposite direction to the normal tracking direction. In addition to changing speed, east must change direction too, right? Well, not necessarily at 2x. Because the tracking motor is always running just so the stars appear to not be moving in the eyepiece, just by stopping that tracking motion, it appears that the telescope is slowly slewing eastward. Looking at our resistor network for setting the 555's clock speed, we see that east opens S1A, which brings a 47k resistor into the timing calculation at 2x. Adding more resistance slows the clock down from tracking speed to something much lower but it can't make it zero, because with no signal coming from the 555 clock, the quartz clock would override it, and it only sends the normal tracking frequency. So it's kind of a bug in this design, because it can't slow the clock to zero. But it can go slower than the tracking speed, and that will cause the scope to apparently move backwards, due to help from the Earth's rotation. Now let's look at slewing at the higher 8x speed. All sorts of interesting things start happening when you press east or west at 8x. 
When West is pressed, its value changes from ground to 12 volts or from a 0 to a 1 in logic terms. When East is pressed, it changes from 1 to 0. For either a West or East key press, this exclusive OR gate's output changes from 1 to 0. Both inputs to the exclusive NOR gate then are 0, so the output is 1 and S1D closes. With S1D closed, it doesn't matter if S1C is open or closed. It's been shorted out of the circuit. Likewise, S1A and B are also irrelevant. We have only a small resistance left, which generates a much faster clock here. This clock will override the quartz clock as usual. Pressing east slews in the opposite direction to the normal tracking direction. In addition to changing speed, east must change direction at 8x, and the way it does that is to reverse whatever the north-south hemisphere switch is set to. Let's see how. Here's another pole of the 8x2x speed switch. It's involved because at the slower 2x speed, east does not actually change the direction of the motor. It just stops the motor and lets the earth's rotation do the rest. But when pressing east at 8x, the left exclusive OR gate output goes high, which changes the other exclusive OR gate from a pass-through to an inverter. Whatever NS was set to is reversed, and that's what the motor controller sees at its M pin, the direction control pin. East has one more trick up its sleeve, and that is this upper 555 timer that is configured for one-shot operation. It's triggered by the down press of the east key. We'll look into that circuit in a future video. Each time the east key is pressed down, this one-shot timer produces a one-second long pulse. The east key normally would cause a zero to propagate through the first exclusive OR gate, and thus a one at the output of the exclusive NOR gate. At 2x speed, it does nothing, but at 8x speed, that would close S1D, which kicks in the fast clock speed as we saw. But in this case, the pulse from the 555 one-shot prevents this for one second. So the 8x speed change is delayed one second before kicking in. Why would it do that? Maybe since east causes a motor direction change at 8x, the motor needs some time to reverse direction before being kicked into high-speed reverse. And with that, we've finished our review of this drive circuit. Hit the like and subscribe buttons if you liked it, and check back if you want to dig in further, because there's some cool stuff going on here that I didn't have time to show in this video. Thanks for watching. 